Buonasera a tutti, welcome everybody. Tonight we have a conversation with Chiara Valerio, an Italian writer, also a friend. I'm very happy to have her here, um, who represents Italy at the 2018 edition of the New Literature from Europe Festival. Uh, and tomorrow at uh, Cervantes Institute, there will be a reading of some writers. And <coughs> Chiara among them. Um, Chiara will talk about Natalia Ginsburg, Caro Michele, and the opening remarks uh, uh, are by Alessandro Giammei. Um, I, I remember when uh, I first read a short story by Chiara Valerio, who was a short story published by uh, Nuovi Argomenti, um, and was for me a, a revelation because it was a short story about installment buying, you know? yes. um, and was, but uh, is a way of uh, of speaking about. Uh, men and women using numbers and and the main character of his um, novel uh, Almanacco del giorno prima is an actuary and I don't know if you know uh, uh, what, uh, what, Michael hi. good evening uh, that you know uh, who is an actuary, uh, I, I discovered reading the novel, is the person who uh, studied the risk of the insurances when you, when you ask to have a contract with uh, an insurance. Um, and uh, when I read that uh, short story, I thought that to be a mathematician and, uh, and a writer at the same time is, it is a, a good idea because <laughs> is you could uh, use different tools no, in, in doing your, your job. And uh, in fact, Chiara Valerio has a doctorate in mathematics from the University of Naples and lives now in Rome. Uh, also, if now sh uh, I remember you, you told me that you don't consider you now a mathematician, but to, to be also in the past is, uh, is something. Um, Chiara Valerio uh, is an editor for, my, for Nuovi Argomenti, a contributor to the literary blog Nazione Indiana. She has written uh, both for theater and for radio. Um, for the Notte Tempo, an Italian publisher, has directed the series Narrativa.it, dedicated to new writers of Italian fiction. She's uh, responsible for the Alta Voce program of Rai Radio 3. Um, she's also a screenwriter. She wrote for Nani Moretti, the movie Mia Madre, and Gianni Amelio. Uh, and now she is the editor of Italian fiction for the publisher Marsilio and collaborates with the Italian newspaper La Repubblica. So as you uh, can understand she does a lot of different things um, uh, yeah. and, and not too much. Uh, she's author of novels and short stories, the last two novels, Almanacco del giorno prima e Storia umana della matematica, was published, were published by Einaudi. Uh, Alessandro Giammei uh, is an assistant professor of modern Italian studies at Bryn Mawr College. He studied a, uh, as a literary historian in Rome at the University La Sapienza. During his doctoral studies at the Scuola Normale Superiore di Pisa, he won a scholarship at the New York University, where he taught for a semester in the Department of Italian Studies. Before joining the Department of Italian and Italian Studies at Bryn Mawr, he was a fellow at Princeton University. So please enjoy. Thank you, Giorgio. So I was told that I, that I was invited to introduce Chiara Valerio. And yeah. most things about K 
Chiravalari were already said by Giorgio. So I'm going to repeat some of them. Uh, we're both going to read tonight because we are native speakers of Italian and we like very much being performative about it. Sometimes my students confess that they're worried about majoring in Italian because they feel pressured by their families, their peers, and guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson to do STEM. If you don't know what STEM is, you don't have kids in college. <laughs> when this happens, I do something that might be rather irresponsible. I reassure them. I explain them that Italian is indeed a STEM discipline. I assign them some very STEM humanistic readings by physicists, engineers, and mathematicians such as Galileo Galilei, Leonardo Sinisgalli, Carlo Emilio Gadda, and Chiara Valerio. Now, unfortunately, Galileo, Sinisgalli, and Gadda <laughs> are currently dead. So tonight, I am only going to introduce Chiara Valerio, a living author who makes Italian worth majoring in, in 2018. Chiara, as Giorgio already said, has a PhD in mathematics. Over the past 15 years, she has authored eight books, countless literary essays in Italy's most prominent journals and newspapers, three scripts for award-winning films, three book-length Virginia Woolf translations, and a couple of radio, radio shows. She has also been one of the most innovative and influential editors in the country, directing the Italian fiction series at Notte Tempo Edizioni and now at Marsilio, as well as Milan's Book Fair a couple of years ago. She had a PhD in mathematics the whole time. <laughs> Chiara is not your typical European writer in New York. She's not bohemian, she's not solemn, she's not cynical. She's not a man. <laughs> She's a very private, public intellectual. She's a polymath. She has what Americans call a Renaissance mind, and we Italians call una capa tanta. <laughs> Even if she channels an extremely authentic Roman accent, she's from Scauri, in the province of Latina. Don't fret if you don't know much about Scauri. As a matter of fact, Scauri, to be perfectly candid with you, is a rather insignificant place in the nowhere zone between Rome and Naples. I'm from Rome. This is why I'm talking in these very strict terms about Scauri. But in her little masterpiece of nonfiction, Spiaggia Libera Tutti, which should be translated into English tomorrow, Chiara turned it, turned Scauri, into a shockingly interesting, crucial, immortal town, part Proust's Compré, part Calvino, Calvino's Eutropia, part Morante's Procida. I believe that Scauri doesn't really exist anywhere but in Chiara Valerio's <laughs> writings, and you're going to hear something about Scauri tonight. I said that Chiara is not typical. A very atypical feature of Chiara's profile as an intellectual is her absolute devotion to service. I'm using this word, service, the way it's used in universities where one has to perform research, teaching, and service. If we were in Italy, I would maybe say philology, or even better, curatela. Chiara has a PhD in mathematics, is an extremely accomplished writer, is a Renaissance gentleman from Scauri, but most of all, she's a reader. She reads the works of other people, and not just as an editor and a reviewer. She reads things and saves them from oblivion. She interweaves her readings and makes them relevant. She makes what she reads entirely hers, and therefore she makes it ours. You'll see what I mean in a few minutes. Tonight, Chiara is going to perform one of her philological magic acts, and I challenge anyone to tell me at the end 
if what she read was fiction, literary theory, equation, interpretation, memory, invention. After all, it is widely known that mathematicians are good at coming up with magic acts that do not really involve any sort of trick. I don't think anyone in this room needs me to introduce Natalia Ginzburg, one of the greatest voices in modern Italian literature. She's also dead, like Sinisgalli, Galileo, and Gadda. Her Lessico Familiare was very recently brilliantly translated by Jenny McPhee for the New York Review of Books Italian series. And I believe that more new translations of her work are happening in, in the United States. It's a good moment for Natalia Ginzburg. Like Chiara Valerio, Ginzburg was a translator, an editor, an author, a woman able to exercise a very rare form of firm but gentle, generously rigorous intellectual power. Natalia Ginzburg and Chiara Valerio both have the gift of contagious affection. They make us love what they love. They produce an immediate attachment that is sometimes hard to explain. They also have in common a very precise idea of how everyone and everything should behave and are good at teaching us conduct, behavior, proper manners. They were both born in the South and adopted by Rome. They both fell in love with London and its authors. They both devoted their life to reading. The main difference between them, I might argue, is that Natalia Ginzburg did not have a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> well, Chiara does. Please join me in welcoming Chiara Valerio. I, I wish I were what Alessandro said in his lines, and I, I thank him because it's the beautiful, the beautiful, the super beautiful introduction that I have had in my life. Mm. And then, uh, thanks, thanks to Giorgio. And uh, thanks to Alessandro. Um, I am I'm going to read um, a short text about Natalia G about Caro Michele, a novel by Natalia Ginzburg, the, that it was a sort of um, I don't know quest of me um, in Natalia Ginzburg lines. Um, I thanks Alessandro because I translated by I translated it by myself for uh, have reviewed the text, and I thanks a lot Michael Frank to have uh, smerigliato. Uh, instead. <laughs> Polished. Polished. Mm. By mail. About all things visible and invisible in Natalia Ginsburg's Caro Michele, according to me. First time, Scauri, Central Italy, the, re the, the early 90s. During my childhood, my mother mentioned many books to me, but two more than any others, and Caro Michele was one of them. This memory is a sound, a recurring one. It begins in 1983 or maybe 1984 because my sister Silvia was born while Julia, the youngest, was not. Caro Michele had been published 10 years before when my grandfather Michele was still alive. It was still safe for him to lie horizontally in a book title and no one had to knock on wood for that. The cover was not the classical white one of prestigious and Audi book but rather a blue thing with a nasty yellow tower in ruins and the thin flies of a neon green moon. It was printed by the Club degli Editori, which in Italy is basically the poor man's reader's digest, unfortunately devoid of those soap pads and supermarket coupons among the pages. My mother whispered the name, Caro Michele, in a loving, enthusiastic voice. Ah, Caro Michele. And I figured that it had to be a book about my grandfather. Then, in my first year of high school, the teacher, Giuseppina Malozzi, chose, the, chose Caro Michele as the novel uh, for us to read, during the summer, to read during the summer. At that point, my grandfather was dead. The memory of my mother's voice had faded, but I whispered at, at my pale green desk with the marks of my drawing compass and the drawing compasses of past generation of students, I whispered the name, Caro Michele, in a loving, enthusiastic voice. Ah, Caro Michele. The teacher stared at me, a big question mark in her eyes, but she didn't say anything. 
The second book that my mother always mentioned as a significant contribution to the greatest Italian literature of everyday life was Ritratto in Piedi, Standing Portrait by Gianna Manzini. I can really tell why an obsessive, an obsessive precocious reader like me had to wait to turn 13 before reading the novel that informed my mother's personal, personal family lexicon and her critical and emotional one too. I guess even I must have been, albeit unknowingly, a rebellious girl. I only read what I want to read, Mom, okay? The first curious thing was that when I looked for Caro Michele on the shelf where it was supposed to be, it was after all my homework for summer vacation, it was not there. There was no trace of Gianna Manzini either. The second curious thing was that when I entered the bookshop to buy both books, which I found in the Inaudi and Mondadori paperback version, and afterward brought them home, my mother claimed that those two copies were her own. I had a white Inaudi paperback in my hand, and I remember very well the blue cover of the cheap Caro Michele. But there was no way to convince her that she was mistaken. She went in her bedroom with Ritratto in Piedi, locked the door, and left me alone with my copy of Caro Michele. Other times, other places, other years. A first thing to disclose, Caro Michele is not, in fact, a novel about my grandfather Michele. <laughs> most of it, and I will tell you later what I mean by most of it, it's, it is an epistolary novel. I also would like to add that, despite the fact that the story starts in winter, I read it at the beach, under a beach umbrella, during my summer vacation. So I didn't really get what Cesare Garboli called the growing and mysterious feeling of cold of the novel. Mm -hmm. The story, as I say, starts in winter. In English, you can elegantly distinguish, distinguish time and tense from weather, whereas in Italian, we just have one word, tempo, and we may rather pompously say that the story of Caro Michele starts not just in the actual season of winter, but also in the very winter of our, of our discontent with all the appropriate verbal tenses. Family Lexicon is the novel in which Lessico Familiare is the novel in which Natalia Ginsburg explains at one point how she and her siblings could always recognize each other even in a dark cave because of the way they spoke using their own personal words and phrases, their own, their own private vocabulary. Caro Michele, by contrast, is the novel in which Natalia Ginsburg shows through the form of the epistolary novel all the ways in which family members may actually fail to recognize each other. She also shows how they nevertheless still cannot ignore each other and how all these missed chances at recognition, all these mistakes in the most literal sense of the word, are the only places where criticism, discussion, and acceptance can happen. Just the way Julian Sorel in Stendhal, The Red and the Black, understands he's not in love or not happy anymore with Matilde and decides to love her with his brains, not with his heart. Love, in Caro Michele, is a way to coexist and to cohabit. I, personally, have never trusted the opposition sense versus sensibility. I've always had the clear intuition that such things and binary logic in general work well with computers, but not with human beings. And after many years of mathematical thinking, I am a mathematician, or at least I was once one. I feel I can defend this intuition quite rigorously. The plot of Dear Michael of Caro Michele is simple enough to summarize. A mother, at home, without a telephone, writes a letter to her son, suggesting that he visit his father, who is ill and may be about to die. Adriana is the mother, Michele the son. The father is just the father, or rather, your father. Michele lives in a basement that his friend Osvaldo, 
we simply Osvaldo, let's leave it at that for now, has loaned him. The basement is dark and Michele paints in the darkness, so Adriana believes he must be painting a lot of holes. <laughs> the father is a painter too, or maybe he was. Adriana talks about his painting in the past tense, but in the present time of the book, he's working on enormous and busy canvases, which make his sweat a lot. Throw seven shirt, as we say in Italian, or rather two, as, Gins as Ginsburg specifies. He has brought a tower, a tower in ruins, and has engaged an architect and bought new tiles for the roof, and he's done all, all this for Michele. The tower, the architect, the tiles. Adriana and the father are divorced. She is actually divorced also from another man. She loved him deeply, but one day, when she was glancing out the window at the roses, he told her, it's over. This is the reason why Adriana, in her new house in the countryside, li lives without a phone and also no roses. She hates roses because they remind her of Filippo, the man who left her. She also hates the two little fire trees that Matilde, her former sister-in-law, planted at the gate of the house. Adriana invited her to come and stay with her in the house, maybe because she had no money, maybe because she felt lonely. So in the house, 10 miles away from the village, with no telephone and no roses, Adriana, Matilde, the housekeeper Cloti, the twins, Michele, younger sister, who always wander around and always are too fast, <laughs> live together. Four rabbits are about to join them, and incidentally, there are no cages for the rabbits. The two other sisters in Caro Michele, Angelica and, Eviola, and Viola, are already married and live in the city, in Rome. The plot of uh, Caro Michele is easy to recount because Michele lives for England and asks, asks everybody to do something for him. He assigned them homeworks especially to Osvaldo and Angelica, and he never comes back to Italy. It's enough for now to say that the verb never means exactly what one could imagine. In Adriana's version of the relationship between Michele and his father, the owner of the cash and his father, there's a spark of uniqueness. For your father, you are the only thing worthy of both tenderness and veneration the only person in the world that he loves and supports, the only person who, whatever he does, does it in the only way it could have been done. The adjective Adriana, the mother, uses for Michele is many of, in many of her letters is balordo, offish or ludic, ludicrous, ludicrous, offish, like any old person. Despite the fact that Michele is her only son, he's offish like any old person, certainly like any old person in his generation. When Michele leaves, uh, he does not come back despite the death of his father and despite the fact that Mara Castorelli, a, gar a girl he slept with, gives birth to baby, who may or may not be his. Michele doesn't come back either for life or for that. Caro Michele is the novel of incertitude. None of the characters understands what or who Michele is, and we, the readers, don't either. Considered from a political perspective, this is because two of Michael's companions have been accused of and arrested for terrorism, and Michele has touched all the components for a semi-automatic gun in his stove. But he says, I'm still not a communist, I'm still nothing, and I've fallen out of touch with the few friends I had in Rome, and I haven't heard anything more about them. On the other hand, from a sexual point of view, this is because of the baby, who does not look like Michele, but may still, may still, and because, despite the fact that Osvaldo married a woman named Ada, a sort of Mr. Wolf from Pulp Fiction, a girl who solves problems, 
and who, in, and who, in point of fact, reconnects the telephone in Adriana's house. Despite the fact that, as I say, Osvaldo is still married, albeit living separately from Ada, many people think that he's gay. Adriana describes him as a pederast. According to Viola, both Michele and Osvaldo are ambidextrous. <laughs> I have a notion about why even we, the readers, know almost nothing about Michele. After all of the life and the thoughts of Mrs. Dalloway, nobody could say. I work for Rai 3, one of Italy's national radio stations, and I'm the co-curator of a daily radio show called Ad Alta Voce. It means aloud. On Ad Alta Voce, we read novels. I mean, I don't actually read them on air myself. The readers are accomplished Italian actors. The idea about Michele came to me when I was listening through my headphone to one of these actors, Tommaso Ragno, reading Bram Stoker's Dracula. Remember that, as I said at the beginning, everyone is what she or he is for most of their time, and I believe this is true for novel as well as for real life, Dracula is also an epistolary novel. Then, Dracula arrives in London, and strange and disturbing things begin to happen. Van Helsing, whom I'm going to call the vampire slayer for simplicity's sake, advances a modest proposal to other people who are hunting the vampires. He suggests they use letters, diaries, and audio transcription as documents, and that they let this evidence instead of thoughts and impressions to help them to anticipate the behavior of the blood-sucking count. From that moment on, the reader is not able to say whether from Mina Harker's diary means that the time is the one in which Mina is writing or the one in which one of the vampire hunters are reading it. The same thing happens with letters and phonographic transcription. The time on the page begins to flow at exactly the same pace of the clock in the reader's room. At the read and the reader is afraid because she or he knows just what the character knows and nothing more. Considering that everyone is what she or he is for most of their time, and I believe this is true for novels as well, and that Caro Michele is, a is an epistolary novel, the readers is therefore definitively on the same ontological level of the characters, and the, readers, and the reader wavers, doesn't know, is worried, chafes, is afraid. Where is Michele? What happens to him? The mechanism Natalia Ginsburg uses in Lessico Familiare to place the reader at the same ontological level of the character is to put the special family word and phrases in quotation marks when they are first used and afterward simply to use them outside of quotation marks, normally from the reminder of the novel. In this way, the reader takes a seat at the Levis table as a member of the family because she or he knows and, in a way, begins to own the no longer private family language. This mechanism, this magic trick in Lessico Familiare that commutes words into places, action, and feelings in Caro Michele is simply turned into letters. <coughs> Considering that great literature is not just a metaphor, the letters are written because Adriana is not connected <coughs> by phone to the rest of her family. And therefore, <coughs> in the early 70s, they were forced to write letters. <coughs> this time, New York City, November 2018. About my grandfather Michele, my caro Michele, I can say that he was a strong and handsome man. He was blonde, he had blue eyes. In his youth, during World War II, he went to the dentist and asked him to pull out his teeth. Twelve of them, <coughs> twelve healthy teeth. Somebody told him that without teeth, he would have been ineligible for combat, that he could have stayed <coughs> toothless at home in Sorrento. <laughs> Africa was a scary place to go. In the end, it was even scarier without teeth. 
My grandfather was a sort of a mystical person, a mystic Catholic. He used to build little votive shrines with the Madonna inside all along the street and in the fields. My favorite one was, and still is, under a pear tree. Even if I know, to be honest, the pear tree isn't there anymore. Everything is lost or rather transformed. My grandfather loved playing with words. I remember he told me that my little plastic canotto or dinghy was actually <coughs> a cane, a dingo, a little dog, a little white dog. When he pointed that out, I was suddenly able to recognize the cane in canotto, the dinghy in dingo. He loved the Bible very much. He loved rabbits too. And he was the go-to person when one had to kill a pig in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I believe he, w he always voted for the Christian Democrats, even if my parents were both communists. He built a tree house for me using half of a barrel. For a long time, I believed that that was the only place where I could really sleep well. Today, I know that it was all about the alcoholic fumes that emanated from the wood of the barrel, <laughs> in which grapes had steeped for more than 60 years. Rather than Caro Michele, the novel about my grandfather could be titled Alla Salute, Michele. <laughs> Yes, so I will, I will if, you're, if you're all okay with that, I will ask the first question to Chiara and then I, I will see if someone wants to ask some other questions. I love this text. I've heard it, a version of it in Italian, and it's super strange because in English it's completely different. But there's something about it that I tried to explain at the beginning, but then when I was reading I realized I didn't, which is, like, I, I want to ask you, Chiara, about this um, magic trick of, so you say that <clears throat> one is what he or she is for most of the time. Mm? This paper, this, this lecture that you do about Caro, Caro Michele, for most of the time it's, it's a talk about Ca Caro Michele. Mm? But then it's not, it's, 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 it's mostly about you. In the end, what you state at the beginning, which is this is not really a book about my grandfather, it's, it's a book by Natalia Ginsburg, it's not true. No, you demonstrate the odds. Yeah, I got it. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, but you use exactly the tools of mathematics no, to, to, to prove the absurd, because this, this, this talk is completely filled with definition, persuasion, demonstration, and counting. There are four rabbits, there are two shirts, not seven. Uh, and measurement, mm? things like that. Then you do an analogy to make it show like, well, logically, no? if it works here this way, it must work in the other thing. And then you get to the barrel, which is very dishonest of you. You say you're honest, but it's not true. <laughs> so I want to ask you, uh, what is it that you read to us in general, but more specifically, um, is there a difference between writing and reading? There's, for me, there's no difference between, write, with, with, between writing, and writing and reading. No difference. But the, the re really important things of my life and I think of a writer's life is that um, it's like Don Quixote, not, uh, in the sense that I hate all the thing, all things that I can't love. Then all the things I love are mine, and all the things I love are I, I, I've lived it. Then, for me, Caro Michele, it's really a book about my grandfather Michele, because all the time I read uh, Natalia Ginsburg's novel, I read about, I remember all my memories about the first time I read the books. When my, and the first time I read the books, the first time my mother pronounced Caro Michele. And, it's, and the pronunciation of Caro Michele in her voice is about the same name of the father. Then, for me, Caro Michele is the name of the father of my mother, and then it's a book about grandfather, because lit reading, writing, is a sound, is a matter of years. 
and then the voice of my mother, the voice of all the people I, uh, I intend to read, the, all the people, I, all, all the books I read, uh, it's, it's mine. Yeah, I trust for myself in all the lines I, I read and I, mm, yes. Isn't this incredibly authoritative and um, in a way aggressive? Because, you know, Don Quixote is a very evil man who forces his delusion and everyone else around him and pretends and then it wants no to it's a, it's a dictator it's a literary dictator like yeah. you will not accept that you don't that you don't enter his fiction no he even like actually beats people that yeah. don't hmm? <laughs> and the, the, so but what you do no it's it's more paradoxical than this because you're incredibly generous because you you come to new york all the way then to just to talk about natalia ginsburg so in a way, this doesn't happen often, now, especially among Italian authors that I know. Like, it have, like Gio Giovanni Stratton came to Princeton to talk about Elsa Morante. No? The, Chiara Valerio talks about Natalia Ghiz. Then there are a couple of other examples that I can think. The rest, 90%, it's like, hello, this is me. I wrote this, <laughs> this book. Here is the book. No, maybe... Uh, ciao come sto. Ciao, ciao come sto. Hi, how are I? How, how, how are I? am I? Chiara doesn't do that. And yet, no, it's even more than that. It's even more than that, because you're basically appropriating Carol. No, I'm, I'm Natalia Ginsburg too. You are uh, Natalia Ginsburg. Yeah, because I'm Natalia Ginsburg too, if I speak about Natalia Ginsburg. I'm Amitav Ghosh when I reduced the book of Amitav Ghosh for the, for the radio. I'm Giorgio Mastraten when I read the uh, short stories by Giorgio Mastraten, because Giorgio Mastraten is a writer too, and an essayist too, in, um, in, uh, in Nuove Argumenti, or in other, parts, in other um, publishing houses. But because I'm, 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 I, I, I'm transforming myself like a Dracula mm -hmm. in everything I love. Then it's easy. You're a very possessive lover. Yeah. I already asked two questions, so I want to open to the. Maybe I should. Why do you say that you were a mathematician and no longer are? If you earn responses, I mean, that's not that important. No, because mathematics for me it's a, it's a posture, it's a way of living, it's a way of studying, it's a amount, it's an amount, of tons of, of an hour. Mm, uh, passed uh, to study formulas and symbolic languages. And I've, I'm not a mathematic now, because my time now is dedicated, is devoted to other things, different from symbolic and languages and, um, and, and formulas. Mathematics is, um, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult subject, because she or he or it pretends for, from you, um, an absolute love. You can distract yourself from mathematics. It's, this is true, and I, I've distracted myself long years, long time ago, and I, I'm not in right. I'm not, um, I, 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 non ho diritto. Um, you, yes. I, I'm not, I have not the right to, to, def to define myself a mathematician. Mm. I'm guilty. <laughs> yeah, I'm guilty, but I was, and when I was, I stand, now no. Maybe it's worth mentioning that Chiara wrote, I think her last book is uh, Storia Umana della Matematica, which, is, which means a human history of mathematics, which is a book of history of science and a fiction, it's very similar to this, but with yeah. mathematicians. And there are a number of mathematicians that she, she, she talks about. And the last mathematician that she talks about is Chiara Valerio. Mm. Does that work? Anyway, are you still not a mathematician if you write a human history of mathematics that ends with Chiara Valerio? Uh, there's a beautiful uh, story about Gershom Scholem, uh, no, by Gershom Scholem, but I'm sure I'm not able to, to, to say it in English. And the story is about uh, a man um, who has a problem, and when he has a problem, he um, must do some prayers. Preghiere? Some prayers. Some prayers. Uh, he, must, he must go in a place in the wood, and uh, he must um, make the fire. Okay. This man is a rabbino. Mm -hmm. A rabbi. Rabbine. This man is a rabbine. Okay, this is the first generation. When the first generation has the problem, he do prayer, he do prayers, he mm, make the fires, and uh, find the place on the wood and go. 
the second generation <laughs> of rabbine, he, he's able to um, go in the wood, ma he can't um, make the fire. And he, say, uh, and he can't say the prayers. Okay. The third generation of rabbines, no place in the wood, no fire, but he can't say prayers. The fourth generation of rabbines, no wood, no prayers, no fire, but he can say and he, he, he can count the story. Then, I am not able to solve an equation. I'm not able <laughs> to demonstrate a theorem. I'm not able to parse it from the hypothesis to thesis, but I can say and tell the story to other people and that in this way, I'm a mathematician and I will be forever a mathematician because I know the story. But in this way, also all the people who read the story can be all the things they want. And this is the way, because I am Natalia Ginsburg now. <laughs> You're a descendant of yourself as a mathematician. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Self genealogy of Chiara Valeria. Self genealogy. Bello. Bello, bello. bello. Self genealogy. When did you realize that your core in life was not mathematics but uh, literature, even though you made, you use mathematics to make literature? Uh, at five, five or five years old, when I was five years old, uh, I never was a mathematician, but, <laughs> but, 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 the, I, uh, but I think that if, if you want to be a great liar and then a great writer, you must learn uh, languages that wh where it's difficult to lie. And mathematics, mathematics, it's a real, in, in mathematics, you have a lot of difficult to lie if you are not very good. And then, uh, for becoming the best liar in Italian modern literature, literature I, went to, uh, I went to study mathematics that, uh, now, that for now, it's the unique faculty of grammar I can um, recognize. Yes, because mathematical, mathematics is a, a language, and it, it's a language um, you can construct uh, perfect phrases and have no significance. Then the, the, great, the greatness of mathematics is the possibility to construct uh, mm, words without mm, no, no sense. Mm. And the loss of sense is uh, the first way. It's like in Indiana Jones, uh, uh, the third, the, um, uh, in the third, when uh, you film, Indiana Jones and the um, last crusade, maledetto. no, ah, last no. crusade. Uh, uh, Indiana Jones, last crusade, uh, Indiana, for s the, um, to, 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 <laughs> to save his father, uh, must to, um, have to do three um, exercises, no, it's a prove. Three challenges. Three no? challenges, so. okay, the first in intellectual one, the second is a physical one, and the third is, in Italiano, il salto della fede. The leap of faith. The leap of faith, okay. Uh, mathematics, the loss of sense is leap of faith. Solo saltando a pie pari dalla testa del leone puoi raggiungere il graal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> only losing science, sense. You can, you can go in another sense that is not in the, not, it's not the sense of, it, it's only a question about body. If you have body, you have a, a kind of truth, and you have a kind of um, recognized or not recognized truth, because you are justice, you have posture, you have a lot of things. If you are not, not in the truth of, uh, in the, in, without body, literature is another, another thing. And to learn the truth without the body, mathematics, it's a good street. No, ma they are totally dada. No, no, they are totally... How do you call it? Situationist, yes. Situationist, they are totally situationist. Then, uh, they, are, no, they are communists. Then the only thing they are worried about, that I remained until 30 years or 40 years without money, and I <laughs> asked money at home for do everything. But this, is, this was not the problem. Then when I, I find my job after a PhD in mathematics, no problem that you can write. Yeah, and I go. <laughs> mm -mm. 
it's a ma they are communists, then it's materialist dialectic, dialectical materialist, then economy is structure and other things are sovrastructure, then overstructure, then it's overstructures mathematics, Superstru superstructure is mathematics, superstructure is literature, superstructure is how you cook the vegetables, <laughs> <laughs> then it's no problem, it's uh, equivalent. A Gramscian family. A Gramscian family. <laughs> like <me. laughs> Uh, in uh, strange languages like Dutch, Hungarian, and Swedish. <laughs> no. No. Not, not for now. Mm. But Hungarian, perché? But this you translated yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but you reviewed and Michael reviewed them. Yes. Mm. It's an alt translation, <laughs> Marcella, too. <laughs> it's for people work. <laughs> <laughs> A try. Can I ask a banal question? Sorry, hoping that someone is going to translate it. Mm -hmm. I want to ask a very banal question. Why did you choose to talk about Natalia Ginsburg, which is not an op like you're a translator of Virginia Woolf. You, there are other authors that I think are very close to your heart. No, why Natalia Ginsburg tonight? For the name of my grandfather. <laughs> <Great>. Thank you. <laughs> And for Michael Frank. And uh, for Michael Frank too. Yeah. I, think. I have a question. See. Si. I have a question for Michael. I'm seeing how hard I can make it. No, I don't need that. That's the same thing. In Cambrai, Monsieur Alfred and Mr. Proust says when he is reading uh, about reading that it's better than life because everything has been put into order and makes more sense and is more logical and all the feelings are there and it's not chaotic and you don't lose your way and it's not boring. So if you become all the books you read, of course you're never boring, you're never chaotic, it's full of feeling, it's in beautiful language. But what about when you're not reading? What happens to your kind of death? But there's no moment in which <laughs> I don't read. <laughs> 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 I read <laughs> continuously. Conti uh, right now. Yes, I read myself. Yeah, I and I continue to read other things. I read the strand of the books. I read ev ev every moment in my life I read. Yes. It's a sort of magical door. And then the, the problem of ordering a life in writing uh, is not this exact my, my point of narrative. But <laughs> no other writer <laughs> then has this point in his narrative. Thank you. To you, Michael Frank. I'm, uh, I'm curious, how do you approach, uh, do, you, do you listen to books? But I work for a program in a radio where we read the books, but uh, is, this is the only way, only moment in, the, in the, my daily life that I listen to books. But no, I don't, it's not a, a practice, uh, it's not my, my mode to read book in by years. But I was wondering how the practice of reading mm -hmm. It's so similar because uh, uh, they are connected to the human voice. Then is mm, radio, radio dramas, and radio books are similar to to reading, but it's an attitude. I'm not this attitude. Maybe I can I can I can have it, I, but for now, no. It's not an habit. It's not an habit. I'm not habit to listen to books, um. but I I think that it's totally similar. Yeah. This is the way I work for the radio. Because not television, no. It's someone who tells a story. This is the this is the point. But for me, that I'm that I, and I am an obsessive reader. The point is that I have a book. I can decide the velocity in which I can read. In the other mode, I can decide the velocity and like Don Quixote, I'm obsessive and uh, and I would, would I would like to decide everything. Almeno when I read the book. Yes, it's like uh, yes, it's like to stay alone and like to 
to ha uh, have love with, be, be in love with someone. Yes. You, maybe you go, if the problem, if the point is the velocity, uh, okay, the po you can go far maybe without the books and, but you go faster <laughs> with books. You stop reading other book. <laughs> you stop. <laughs> this is the, now. This is fantastic question, but the answer is, is simply because I write super faster things. Then I begin to write really when I reread my things. Then I, I, the first version is super super fast. Mm, I can write really a lot of tons of words, super fast. Then I write re really. When I read it. Did you read a lot of it or not? No. No, no, no. The sound of words doesn't No, in fact, I've translated three books by Virginia Woolf and you understand my pronunciation, are you? <laughs> 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 Thank you. But when I made the first translation of Flash by Virginia Woolf, I bought the audiobooks to understand the rhythm of the translation in English and then in Italian. And the translation is, is for me, and not only for me, it's really good, the, the first one. But you, you can understand from my pronunciation that, and also from my way to speak in Italian, that I <laughs> read <laughs> silently in my head. Virginia Woolf is to read her work over to herself every morning in the bathtub. Everything she wrote the day before she read out loud. And now she was finished, Michael, <laughs> in the river. <laughs> Did she say that everything is vocal? It, see, the word is vocal. Yes, mm -hmm. one of the phrases, r recurring phrases in Virginia Woolf, Woolf, Woolf's words is the word is vocal. Mm. Yeah. Questa è veramente è una bellissima idea. Sì, sì. Ah, sì. I saw a hand Fun. there. Grazie, Francesco. If you have any um, comments that you'd like to make, more comments. If you have any comments about the book, Caro Michele, or the author, Natalia Ginsburg which separate and apart from yourself or your experience of it? If I have comments different from this. No, no, <laughs> the, only, no the, only, the only critical fact in this essay is about the, how a writer can um, put the reader in the same ontological position of the characters. This is the only analysis, um, the only point of critics uh, excerpt from my experience in, the, in reading the book. And for me, it's a good point because the, um, it's, it's, it's a good way to dismantle things and for, for, understand, for understanding it. Then so if you, the question is, no, only this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only this one. Excuse me. Does your editor by any chance tell you suggestions of what to write or, or is it all yours? No, no, it's all mine. No, for now it's all mine. I don't know in the future, but for now it's, it's yes, it's all mine. Maybe it's better at the beginning, but I will do it so I apologize. I'm gonna ask you now. Um, since you have this kind of identification of what you're reading, I would like to know what you're reading right now to what you're writing. 
I'm writing about a man who lost the heart and the stomach and remains in life. And the book begins like mm, the me Metamorphosis of Kafka. Andrea Di Leva si era svegliato una mattina dopo sogni inquieti nel suo letto e non aveva più il cuore. And it's a novel maybe about um, the, the, the nature human beings have that is uh, it's in relation with other people and other things, that we are not alone, we are a part of our um, social corp, social body. And then if a part of this body is ill, other parts can, can help then maybe it's about this one, this, this, this theme. Um, mm, yes. Because I'm sure. 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 Two books about scientists, one about Sandra Tavaglio, that is an, Ameri an Italian astrophysic that, was, that spends a lot of time in Virginia Tech, and the last about Stefano Mancuso, that is a neurobiologist, and he's teaching mm, green life, something like this, in Università di Firenze. Uh, and, and in Italy, now, uh, Adelphi repu had republished uh, books by Leonora Carrington, that spent a lot of time here in New York, and this was a painter, but a boy. <laughs> okay. um, and then the two last short, uh, collection of short stories by, by Leonora Carrington. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank <laughs> you.